brief word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray for the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus by your Holy Spirit to rest upon every mind in this place in order that their perception of what we teach tonight and over the next six weeks will be clear, heard, as you intend what I say to be heard, that there'll be no miscalculation, misunderstanding. Let me be very, very clear, very, very simple, that every person here, oldest, the youngest, the newest Christian, the most mature, understands what we're teaching. We're not here to be clever, to say things that are profound. We want to teach what is true, that it will make a difference in our lives. I want these Friday nights to be life-changing, beginning tonight. And I pray that all that is said and taught tonight and over the next several weeks will bring great honor and glory to your name. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Two verses of Scripture that I came across in my reading today uh, and I thought would work nicely. Uh, and the first is from Proverbs chapter 19, verse 2. It is not good to have zeal without knowledge. It is not good to have zeal without knowledge. I don't know whether we have people here that are zealous, but that's not enough. Zeal is good, but it's not good to have zeal without knowledge. And the other passage of Scripture uh, that I want to refer to is Colossians chapter 2, verse 2. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The theme tonight is why study theology? Why not just a book in the Bible? What is the point? Well, my answer is because theological mindedness, assuming that it is centered on sound teaching and spirituality, true spirituality, is the best remedy against being blown here and there, as Paul put it, by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Now, teaching. What is the difference between teaching and preaching? Well, there's two Greek words. Teaching comes from the Greek word didasko. Uh, preaching from kerygma, which refers to a message. Uh, but the words can be used interchangeably. Because if you trace the words teaching and preaching, uh, take in Mark or Luke or Matthew, in one place it'll say teaching in the same exact story, in the other it's preaching. So they can be used interchangeably. But generally speaking, teaching is just giving out information, whereas preaching is applying it and with a message with a view of trying to see people converted. But what we will do over these weeks is simply to convey certain things that I think are important. And teaching is giving information. But if it is combined with true spirituality, and that will be the goal, uh, then your life should never be the same again. So that if you are on the spot and that you need to defend what you believe, uh, you'll be in better shape to do it. Now, many of you will have heard what I'm about to say now, but I want to state my conviction right at the beginning, that it seems to me 
that there has been in the church, speaking generally, a silent divorce between the Word and the Spirit. Now, when there's a divorce, sometimes the children stay with the mother, sometimes the children stay with the father. In this divorce, you have those that are on the Word side and those that are on the Spirit side. Well, to oversimplify, you could say Westminster Chapel uh, for many years was a Word church. And you could say that Kensington Temple for many years was a Spirit church. I don't think anybody would uh, find fault with that analogy. Now, what's the difference then? We'll take those of us, our stable, our background is, is a word church. We say, the honor of God's name will not be restored until we get back to sound teaching, earnestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints, know your doctrine, understand the Reformation teaching, justification by faith, assurance of salvation, sovereignty of God, and until we get back to those teachings, the honor of God's name will not be restored. What's wrong with that emphasis? Nothing. It's exactly right. It's what I believe. Take those on the spirit side. Speaking generally, the emphasis would be, we need to get back to the book of Acts, where there were signs, wonders, miracles, gifts of the spirit in operation, when they had a prayer meeting, the place was shaken. Literally, the building, you could say maybe 3.2 on the Richter scale. The place was shaken, such power. Get into Simon Pat Peter's shadow, you're healed. Lie to the Holy Spirit, struck dead right on the spot. And until we get back to that kind of power, the honor of God's name will not be restored. Well, what's wrong with that emphasis? Nothing. It's exactly right. It's what I believe. But the problem is, speaking generally, and there are exceptions. I don't think many. And those exceptions are simply where there's an effort to bring the Word and the Spirit together. But nearly wherever I go in the whole world, and since retiring from Westminster Chapel, God has given us a worldwide ministry uh, this year we'll go to India, uh, China, uh, Singapore. Uh, here I am in London. Uh, wherever I go, it seems to be one or the other. You can tell almost in 30 seconds or maybe 10 seconds whether you're in a word church or a spirit church. Uh, it is my view that the two coming together, the simultaneous combination will result in spontaneous combustion and the awakening and the revival that we long for will take place. And some of you will know that it's my own conviction that this is coming. Uh, we won't probably deal much with eschatology. Uh, uh, we might. I haven't thought through everything we're going to do. But my next book, which actually was finished uh, yesterday, sent it in to the publisher today. is called The Midnight Cry, uh, based upon Matthew 25, when the five wise virgins and five foolish virgins, in their sleep, were suddenly awakened in the middle of the night. Uh, and that represents the church asleep. Because I cannot imagine a more apt description of the church than this. The church is asleep. The thing about being asleep is you don't know you were asleep until you wake up. This afternoon, uh, I was sitting on the couch with Louise, and I just put my head back. And I said to her, was I asleep? And she said, yeah, for 20 minutes. You don't know you were asleep until you wake up. And I don't think the church is aware that it is asleep. Now, the sad thing about sleep, you do things in your dreams you wouldn't do if you were awake. And the church, doing things today and tolerating things, approving of things they would not do if awake. Well, it is my view then that 
The next thing to happen on God's calendar is not the second coming, but the awakening of the church just before the second coming. And I believe it'll go right around the world. And I think it's going to happen soon. And if you put me under a lie detector, I think I'll be alive to see it, at least the beginnings of it. And I'll be 81 years old in July. So, Lord, you better hurry. <laughs> There's not much in the theology of Karl Barth that I would agree with. He was a German theologian in the 20th century. Uh, he is regarded, and I think rightly so, as the greatest theologian since Jonathan Edwards uh, 200 years ago. Uh, I wouldn't want you to read Bart. On the other hand, I doubt you'd understand him, so you'd be safe. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't want you to read him and understand him or believe him. But there's one thing he did say that I agree with. Every Christian is called to be a theologian. And I would like to think that you would aspire to be a theologian. You say, me? No chance. Do you know what it was said of Peter and John? In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, they noticed they, they, were, they were regarded as, as ignorant men. That doesn't mean stupid. It just means they hadn't had much education. They didn't know a lot. Uh, they were unschooled, hadn't been to university, much less seminary. And they only had one thing going for them. They'd been with Jesus. That, that was what it was said of Peter and John. They took note that they were unschooled, but they'd been with Jesus. They could not have known that one day they would write books that would be part of the New Testament. You've got one Peter, two Peter. You've got the Gospel of John. One John, two John, three John, book of Revelation. And so you don't have to go to university to be a theologian. You don't have to have a degree in theology. You don't have to be a minister. You don't have to be a full-time Christian worker or in full-time Christian service to be a theologian. And I would urge you to realize this is something that is open to you. And you may have never dreamed that you could be a theologian, but that's what I would like you to be. And I would like to think that God would raise up people from this congregation. Who knows? what you could do. Even after the cry that comes in the middle of the night that wakes up the church, uh, the second coming doesn't take place two days later. We don't know how much time afterwards. It's a debatable point. But you will be needed more than ever after the cry that will wake up the church. And it will be a new pecking order. And it won't surprise me at all that it will be people like you that will be center stage in this coming awakening. Well, my task is to prepare others for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up in the knowledge of the Son of God. So it's my job to prepare you to do the work of ministry. Paul said... 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. The King James Version is study. Study to show, your, show yourself approved unto God. Um, and it would be a wonderful thing if something could happen tonight that you are determined to be the kind of person that Paul mentions here in, uh, in uh, 2 Timothy 2, 15. But he also said to Timothy, it's very interesting, in 2 Timothy 3, verse 10, he said, you know all about my teaching 
But the next phrase is, and manner of life. You know all about my teaching, my doctrine, my manner of life. And that's what I mean by what I said in the very beginning, that theological mindedness, assuming that it is centered on sound teaching and true spirituality, teaching, doctrine, spirituality, manner of life. What kind of person are you? What are you like when you are alone? One of my strongest teachings is that we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of the things done in the body, whether they be good or bad. I don't have time to go into the details of that, only to say that a reward at the judgment seat of Christ, how do you suppose you get it? It's not talking about salvation. We're saved by the blood of Jesus. And that gets us to heaven. But like it or not, every Christian will stand before God and give an account of your personal life. And some will get a reward and some won't. What that reward is? Unprofitable speculation. If it's no more than Jesus saying, well done, that's good enough for me. But here's my point. That reward, what is it based on? Is it going to be based on how well known you were? Do you think a prime minister will have a better chance of getting a reward than you or me? Do you think being born into royalty, does that give you a head start? Not at all. Do you think that I will get a reward because I've written some books and that I'm preaching? No, no chance. If I get a reward, it will be based upon the kind of husband I am, the kind of father I am, the kind of man I am. And so it's level ground. All of us can get a reward, all based upon true spirituality. And so keep that in mind. We're talking about sound teaching plus true spirituality. I would hate to think that you become an expert in some of the doctrines that we teach over the next several weeks, but your life doesn't show it. Would rather you just stop coming if all you want is to pick up a bit of theology. There are those who are sermon tasters, and, and, and that's, they, they, they like that. We're not interested in, in sermon tasters here. But I'd like to see those who want their lives to be changed and that you're able to defend the faith. This Peter, who was once unschooled, now talks about in, in 1 Peter 3, 15, being able to give an answer, to give an answer. Many people give the answer, well, I'll have to ask my pastor. I want you to be able to say, I can give you an answer. Doesn't mean you'll know everything, but you'll know more than you ever did. And you can be used of God, and you'll be amazed how he will use you. Now, Paul went on to say in 2 Timothy, the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. And he talked about they would heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. There are teachers, teachers in the church, there are pastors who just want to please the people. Not interested in changing lives. Very careful never to offend because they want not to offend. And the funny thing is that the more a, a generation of Christians become uh, so paranoid about offending people, the less people come to church. Uh, there became a phrase called seeker-friendly. And it's not all bad, but it's not all good. And uh, I'm not a seeker-friendly person as far as what I preach. 
Not at all. Because I'm here to defend the faith. And of course I like it when people compliment me. I'm as human as you get when it comes to things like that. But we're not here just to pander to you and make you feel better. We want to learn together. There are teachings going on. And right here in London, uh, just since we retired, it was 2002, uh, 14 years ago. What is going on? Uh, no one would have thought it. And some of those who now were solid evangelicals, at least I thought they were, now openly, you know, refuting things that the church has stood for. Uh, and there's a teaching abroad called hyper grace. It, it's deadly. It's of the devil. But it sounds so good when you hear it. And people are succumbing to it. There's a teaching called open theism. The idea that God doesn't know the future. And the idea is that uh, God is looking for us to tell him what to do. Because he's depending on us, getting input from us. Do you like a God like that? You, you see. You, you say, God, uh, show me what to do. And he says, I want you to show me what to do. I mean, that, that's, that's really what open theism comes down to. It's man-centered. And so that, that's the problem. The present trend toward man-centeredness. And what's in it for me? That type of thinking has created a vacuum that has left the church in a powerless and superficial state. I want you to start asking the question, I wonder if you ever thought to ask this before, what's in it for God? We all want to know what's in it for me. I want you to ask the question, what's in it for God? Well, too many Christians cannot tell you for sure what they believe or why they believe it. And this is also true when it comes to church history. Now, I'm not here to make anybody feel bad. Please, I'd, I'd feel horrible if I thought that I made you feel bad because you say, well, we, I don't know anything. I don't think I want to go back there because I feel stupid. That wouldn't be my motive at all. Quite the opposite. But I do want to say church history you need to know a little bit about it. It's called the laboratory of theology. Because the more you know of the past, uh, the better equipped you will be for the future. Because in the past, you can see where mistakes were made and how theology was shaped. Uh, and the trouble is, uh, too many Christians know nothing at all about the history of the Christian church. And knowledge of the past will help us to understand the present and face the future. Well, all of us need motivation to be disciplined. Now, when it comes to the kind of uh, stuff, if that's the right word, you will hear from me over the next several weeks, this is not everybody's cup of tea. I commend you that you wanted to come. And some subjects will be maybe more thrilling than others. Maybe uh, there'll be a subject you think, oh, I don't think I want to go to that one. Well, that's entirely up to you. There's no fee. You're not paying. Uh, you're not committed. Uh, but sometimes the subject that you think will not bless you may be the one you need most and will bless you more than you thought. In any case, it means discipline. Don't come running because you can't wait to be here because it really appeals to you. Uh, I can tell you this. In my own personal devotional life, I try to keep up a Bible reading plan. Uh, I've, I've done it for 40 years or more. And, and to pray so much a day. I don't think I ever feel led to do those things. If I went by how I felt... I'm not sure I would pray very often. Uh, years ago, the Billy Graham people made that old spiritual uh, popular. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I'll pray. If I waited, 
until I felt the Spirit moving in my heart, I don't know that I'd pray once a week. I'm sorry that you'd be disillusioned with my spirituality. I do it because it's right. There are things you do. And so it is when it comes to motivating yourself because these weeks will go by quickly and they're going to do you no harm. Well, a school of theology may help motivate us to get on with learning what is long overdue. And Colin Dye is to be commended that he wanted to do this. This is not my idea. I, it never crossed my mind, to be honest. Never thought of it. And it was his idea. He knows exactly what I believe. And as far as I know, he would sign his name to everything that I preach. We're on the same team. And he wants Kensington Temple to have the benefit of the theology I hold to. Well, a school of theology may help us discipline our minds that they will be filled with godly knowledge. Well, now, here's a question. Why theology and not just the Bible? And that's a good question. One can learn facts about the Bible and miss the important principles that lie behind these facts. For example, take the story in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve in the garden. Uh, and you may know certain things that are taught or facts, but when it comes to other things that are implied, marriage, family, it's all in Genesis 3. This is where theology gets in. N nature of sin, temptation, results of the fall of Adam and Eve. That's where theology comes in. It's one thing to know that Jesus died on the cross. Quite another to know what the blood of Jesus meant to the Father. Have you ever asked that question? Most of us want to know, what's the blood of Jesus for me? What does it do for me? Ask the question, what does it do for God? If anything, it's more important. Because he's the one that needs to be satisfied. All right. We've all got our biases. But you need to know that theology, being shaped by church history, can help us and understand things that we might not have thought of. Uh, issues develop in church history. And theology becomes an issue. Let me give you an example. If 150 years ago, you heard the phrase, baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you gave it to all the church, the pastors, the vicars. What is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And you asked that 150 years ago. You'd be amazed. You wouldn't recognize it. Ask it today, immediately. It comes into the issue, oh, well, that's, that's uh, speaking in tongues, isn't it? But that, that wasn't going on 150 years ago, as far as we know. Certainly wasn't in the public domain that anybody thought about it. But church history, because in this case, Azusa Street in Los Angeles, the early 20th century, where a group of together, uh, the Spirit came down and began to speak in tongues. And, uh, and the, the term Pentecostal emerged. Uh, that became part of their theology. And it became known. And Elam, Pentecostal Church, that's what Kensington Temple is. So I'm only saying that the phrase baptism of the Holy Spirit would have been understood 150 times differently than 150 years ago. Or take the teaching of justification by faith. If you'd asked Thomas Aquinas that uh, in the 13th century, you wouldn't recognize it. When Martin Luther came to see the meaning that faith satisfies the passive justice of God, 
it turned his life upside down. It turned the world upside down. But as a result of his experience, this is part of church history, theology changed. That is to say, your concept of what the Bible teaches. Um, and it's interesting. You'll find this to be true. When somebody is saying anything that seems innovative, he's always held in suspicion. You want to know, who said it before? Who are you to say that? And so, uh, I've had this problem over, over the years. In our 25 years at Westminster Chapel, there were a few things that I saw that I hadn't read in any book. And the immediate question is, well, where did you get that? Who said it? Well, if you can show who said it, they might believe you. But if you can't, I'm not sure I would believe you. Uh, <laughs> at the Wembley Conference Center in 1992, when the first Word and Spirit Conference was being held, I made the case that one day, before the Second Coming, the Word and Spirit is going to come together and it'll be the greatest revival in the history of the church. Well, I did not know that anybody ever said that before. Someone came to me afterwards and said, you got that from Smith Wigglesworth. <laughs> really? Did he say it? I'd heard the name. I, I thought he was just a faith healer that hit people in the stomach and they got healed. And uh, I've taken a year or more to get to the bottom of whether he said it. And it, it turns out that he did, basically, that. Well, I'm going to use that from now on. <laughs> Why? I want to be believed. And they're not going to believe me. Who am I? Why should they? But if I can say Smith Wigglesworth said it first, they say, oh, that's interesting. Luther went through the same thing. Whenever he said something that hadn't been said before, he did his best to find somebody who said it first. And both Luther and Calvin learned from Augustine. Augustine was their best friend. And if they could say Augustine said it, it gave them mileage. Did you know that the Apostle Paul had to do the same thing? Yes. Paul. He was saying things that everybody said, wherever did you get that? Namely, his teaching of justification by faith. Who do you suppose he quoted? Abraham. David, the Psalms, that gave him mileage. Of course, we know that the New Testament is the inspired Word of God, but you need to realize that Paul, among many Jews who were believers, were very suspicious. Well, we're all wanting to learn, and when we come up with something that seems novel, innovative, uh, people are going to be suspicious. And you want all the help you can get. And that is why theology is shaped in part by church history. And so, as uh, Luther and Calvin would quote Augustine or Athanasius whenever they could, uh, but there'll be some who say, well, I just want to read the Bible like Paul. Uh, I don't need Augustine or Athanasius or Calvin. Well, we all have our prejudices. And in order to be believed, and you want to be believed, and people to think that you're not a nutcase, and you're saying something that's worthwhile, it's nice to think, well, somebody said it first. And so, in my 25 years at Westminster Chapel, every chance I could quote Martin Lloyd-Jones, I would, because that gave me mileage. That's what I mean by church history is the laboratory of theology. Well, we all have our prejudices. And we need to understand our prejudices and how we got them and where they may need some correcting. All right, the word theology. What do you suppose it means? It comes from two Greek words. Theos, God. Logos, word. And so, logos and theos, you can see theology right there. Theos, logos, theology. And it really means 
Word of God. Theology means Word of God. So we're back to the Bible the moment we say theology, but then the onus is on us to make sure that what we're saying is upheld by Holy Scripture. But I want to get this over to you, that the word theology is not a bad word. And would you believe that it was once regarded as the queen of the sciences? Let me tell you one of the saddest developments that have come in the last 200 years. Would you believe that two to three hundred years ago, if you were extremely clever, you were a genius, do you know what it would be that you would likely study? And if you went to university, that's what you would study. You know what it was two or three hundred years ago? Theology. It was the queen of the sciences. Oxford University was born in this. In fact, the uh, slogan, the motto the, on the University of Oxford's coat of arms is Dominus Illuminatio Mea. From Psalm 27, verse 1, the Lord is my light because it was the queen of the sciences. But if there's a clever person today, a genius, a budding star, brilliant, they go into science or computer technology. And it is so sad that the greatest minds are not looking to theology. And this is partly because of the decline of the influence of the church. People are just not motivated. They're just not motivated to go in that direction. So theology has passed behind a cloud. Do you know what my ambition is? My great ambition? My greatest ambition? I'd love to make God famous. I want to make him famous. Do you remember what the Beatles said just a year or two after they got known? We're more popular than Jesus. And they were right. Shouldn't be. I long to make the God of the Bible famous. Trouble is, uninteresting preachers, dull theologians, less able men have moved in where spiritual giants once held sway. And so correcting this trend is not going to be easy. But why shouldn't we think, maybe tonight, you know, after all, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 14. Who has despised the day of small things? And if just, you know, two or three out of this crowd would be electrified, excited by this, and, and, and you can just vow you're not going to follow the trend, and you're going to go where... Giants once stood, although you may feel alone today. I referred to Athanasius. Do you know who he was? Theologian in the 5th century. He's the one that made the case, and he was in a minority for a long time, that Jesus is very God of very God. Very man of very man. And they said to Athanasius who is a black theologian from North Africa. Athanasius, the world is against you. He flashed those black eyes and said, if the world is against Athanasius, Athanasius is against the world. <laughs> the willingness to stand alone. So correcting the trend won't be easy. Learning theology may not come naturally. It will take effort. And when Jesus said, strive in, strive to enter in to the straight gate, he used a Greek word, agonazio. It means to agonize, agonize. All right, let's move on to another point. 
sound theology combines both the mind and the heart. So one without the other will lead to a defect. Emphasis on the intellect alone is dangerous. And the trouble with most theology, theology today, and if you were to go uh, to Oxford or Cambridge or to a typical seminary, it's just like 99% cerebral, intellectual, words, learning, concepts. The emphasis on the intellect. And when that takes place, it is dangerous. Here's why. Said Paul, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. So the intellect is only one part of our personality. Intellectual stimulus alone breeds pride and leads to dullness and self-righteousness. There's nothing that will make a person so self-righteous as intellectual pride. Don't let it happen in this place. That said, emphasis on the heart alone is dangerous. Said Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked, beyond cure, so that the heart and emphasis on the heart can lead to an overemphasis on emotional feeling. You probably heard this. I don't know who said it first. Emphasis on the Word without the Spirit, we dry up. Emphasis on the Spirit without the Word, we blow up. Emphasis on both, we grow up. Ignoring the intellectual side of personality can lead to false pride and self-righteousness so that if it's all emotion for you, you still are vulnerable to self-righteousness. Well, then someone was going to say, but if you emphasize both, does that mean you're going to be exempt from being self-righteous? <laughs> we might be worse off than ever. To say, oh, I believe in both. Let's just be careful about that. The best theology will be shaped on our knees. I've often been amazed that I managed to get through my seminary uh, before we came to England. I went to Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, today it's become quite conservative. When I was there, it was very liberal. Uh, the theologians, were, they followed Karl Barth, Emil Brunner, the New Testament scholars, Rudolf Bultmann, liberals, don't really believe the Bible at all. They just use the Bible for their own thoughts and ideas just to impress people. Uh, some exceptions to that, but generally speaking, that's the way it was. And there came a moment, I'm almost ashamed to say it, but that, I was enamored with Karl Barth. And it was the Holy Spirit in, an, in, in a, uh, a moment, in a, in a moment when I was praying, an immediate witness of the Spirit that stopped me. Or I, I wouldn't be here today. I hate to think where I would be. Because liberal theology can be very contagious. And the best theology will be shaped on our knees. And God got me through that. Prayer is the antidote to dullness and intellectual pride. Prayer is the vehicle by which our hearts remain sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit does not reveal is not worth knowing. John 6, 63. Jesus said, it is the Spirit that gives life. The Spirit quickens. The flesh profits nothing. I want to write a book on that one day. The flesh, zero, nothing, nil. The Spirit makes all the difference. Well, for this reason, our school of theology will be constantly endeavoring to correct itself by the practical as well as the cerebral, and will be constantly aware of the danger of being unbalanced.
Dr. Lloyd-Jones used to use the phrase going from the general to the particular in introducing a subject. So generally speaking, theology has seven branches. We start out with revelation. The word revelation, it refers to the inspiration of the Bible. Uh, so when we talk about the doctrine of revelation, don't confuse it with the book of revelation. Uh, we're not talking now about the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, but the doctrine of revelation. The revelation comes from the Greek word meaning unveiling. It means to unveil what is hidden. So, I'm going to, this is going to be a hard phrase for some, but I'll try to explain it. Revelation is to theology what epistemology is to philosophy. Now here's what I mean. Epistemology is a word that means how do we know? How do we know anything? And so that's in philosophy. We'll bring it over to theology. We call it revelation, unveiling. How do we know? And it comes to one thing. We're talking about the Bible. Revelation, the way God reveals Himself. And uh, there are those who would make a case, well, God reveals Himself in nature. He reveals Himself in providence. Uh, and all these things have merit. But the main thing is, how do we know it's the Bible? And we begin there. And those that are philosophers make fun of this. They make fun of it. And uh, we don't. This, we're just letting you know, when it comes to revelation, how do we know? Uh, we know that God reveals himself through the Bible, through the Word. Uh, now, this is so important uh, that uh, we understand this. When you go to seminary, or do a course at a university, uh, the things that we will teach, they would not think of teaching. As I said, it's mostly cerebral. Uh, but I can't recall any time I was in seminary that anybody emphasized your personal prayer life. Wouldn't be, wouldn't be on their radar screen. They wouldn't even insist that you read the Bible. They would want you to know it because you need to refer to it. But uh, they wouldn't see it as your life. It's just part of, of what we believe. But this school of theology is based entirely upon the belief that the Bible is infallible. It's the Word of God... And this is the way God reveals himself. And all other ways, whether through nature, providence, that's subsidiary, we begin with the Bible. Uh, but in seminary, I never got a course on how to lead a soul to Christ. Half of them didn't think you needed to do it anyway, much less teach you how to do it. And uh, never have I heard of a course on how not to grieve the Holy Spirit. That's about as important as it gets. This is what I mean, dear friends, that this school of theology is, is a bit different. You're not going to get a degree from it. Uh, people may smile when they hear that you've been here. Uh, they won't think, oh, this is marvelous. But this will change your life. And this will do you no harm. This is what will hopefully draw you closer to God and there'll be something about you, hopefully, hopefully, that people will want what you've got. Well, that's what we want to teach. All right, the word revelation refers to the way God reveals himself. God has revealed himself in the Bible by the Holy Spirit. So there is a sense in which revelation and Scripture are used interchangeably. 
We know the Bible is the Word of God by the inner testimony of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there, is two, there are two ways to come to understanding the Bible as being the Word of God. One is called the external witness, and the other is the internal witness. What's the difference? The external witness would be, for example, studying archaeology. And you go to Israel and dig and find things in the ground. And they come up with artifacts and things. Oh, guess what? There really was an ancient Jericho. And we're supposed to say, oh, good, now I can believe the Bible. But there are those who say, you don't want to believe the Bible until archaeology shows it first. That's external witness. And you can wait a thousand years. And then sometimes archaeology will go against Scripture, because that's sometimes what the professors want. The point is, archaeology is not the way to come to understanding the Word of God. Another kind of external witness is just testimonies of great people who've said the Bible was so important to me. You find statesmen and famous people over the centuries that have, you know, talked about the Bible. And that may cause some to start wanting to read it. So I, I wouldn't dismiss, but these are still external witnesses. The internal witness is the inner testimony of the Holy Spirit. And here's the wonderful thing. In you is the author of this book. Inside of you, the Holy Spirit he wrote this book, and it is the Holy Spirit's greatest product. The Holy Spirit's greatest product. So if you want to get to know the Bible, get to know the author. Now, you can't always get to know the author of a book that you read, but all of us can know the author of this, the greatest book ever, the Bardians would say it contains the Word of God. And that sounds good, except they don't go far enough. We're not talking about a book that contains the Word of God. We're talking about a book that is the Word of God. And it's the Holy Spirit that will witness to that. I could not preach apart from wanting to believe every word of this. One of the things that has convinced me of the infallibility of Scripture is the way I go through a book when I preach. At Westminster Chapel, we went through uh, the book of Acts, Galatians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Hebrews. We spent 10 and a half years in Hebrews. 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Jude. And it was the way I would read the Bible and understand it that would make me know this really is God's Word. It's only the Holy Spirit that will do that. And He will never fail you. That's how you know. Get on good terms with the Holy Spirit. All right. Theology has seven branches. The first, revelation. Second, cosmology. Uh, refers to creation. Now we've got two Greek words, cosmos and logos. Logos, word, cosmos, means world or order of things. So, cosmology is the study of creation. It partly deals with the question, did God create the world, the universe, and all that is in it, or did it evolve by happen or chance? That's cosmology, part of the branch of theology. Cosmology also deals with environmental issues climate change, global warming, these issues. Third branch, anthropology. That's the study of man, from anthropos, man, logos, word. Whenever you see logi, L-O-G-Y, at the end of a word, remember it comes from the Greek word logos. And so anthropology is the study of man. Deals with the question, was man created, or did he evolve? And so anthropology will deal with such issues as, is 
man, or the politically correct word, humankind, <laughs> fallen. Is humankind, or man, people, a dichotomy or trichotomy? We won't go into that except to say dichotomy means that you are two-part, body and soul. And those that are trichotomists believe body, soul, and spirit. It's not anything to get too exercised about. I know people that get emotional. Oh, it's trichotomy. Uh, and they really think that's important. And, and I know what they mean by that. But most evangelical theologians would say, basically, we're body and soul. The study of human psychology. Uh, and there is a basis for this in theology. It's part of anthropology. Fourth, soteriology. That is the doctrine of salvation. The word soter means salvation, and logos, word, so. Soteriology, the study of salvation. So the question is, how are we redeemed? The words salvation and redemption can be used interchangeably. They each have their own meaning. The word salvation means that we're saved from our sins. The word redemption means that we're bought back by the blood of Christ. Um, I think soteriology is the widest area that will be covered in our future lessons. And uh, dealing with such subjects as the atonement, justification, predestination, the law, faith, sanctification, assurance. Whether these specific ones are going to be dealt with, we haven't totally decided yet. Uh, we're praying carefully what to do uh, from week to week because uh, we have six weeks and then we'll take a two-week break and then another six weeks in May and to the end of June. Next, pneumatology. You don't pronounce the P, P-N-E-U, but the funny thing is, in the Greek, you do. It's pneuma. The word for spirit is pneuma. But in English, we say pneuma. And that is the study of the Holy Spirit. Pneuma and logos, study of the Holy Spirit. And this branch of theology overlaps with all that we've set up to now, but is extended to such subjects as the gifts of the Spirit, the anointings of the Holy Spirit, and also the fruit of the Spirit. One of the important differences between word people and spirit people. Do you know what it is? Word people emphasize the fruits of the Spirit. Spirit people emphasize the gifts of the Spirit. And so spirit people will say, you're not spiritual if you don't believe in the gifts. The word people say, well, you're not spiritual if you don't show the fruits, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. But back to what I said originally, uh, we need not one or the other, but both. And the Word and the Spirit coming together. The fruits of the Spirit, gifts of the Spirit. It's impossible to say that one is more important than the other. They are equally important. Sixth, ecclesiology. That means the church. The word ecclesion means the called out. The called out, or church, and logos, word, study of the church. Uh, and this would deal with subjects like baptism, the Lord's Supper, issue of church and state, or authority in the church. Uh, do we have apostles today? Uh, do we have prophets? Uh, and so forth. And so this is uh, part of ecclesiology. And there are those who really get excited about things like this. I was in South Africa a couple years ago, and um, the, one of the men I met there, every time we'd have lunch together, he wanted to talk about ecclesiology, authority, whether there was an apostle, who's the leader, what you call him. And after two or three lunches, he was just going on. I said, stop. 
This is all you want to talk about, isn't it? I could I ask you a question. Would you go to, to the stake for your ecclesiology? He said, no, I don't think I would. I said, then start preaching what you'd go to the stake for and quit wasting your time on peripheral points. But ecclesiology is a part of theology, and I'm only giving you the perspective, going from the general to the particular. And then seventh, eschatology. Eschaton, eschatos, means last things, logos word, so it's the study of last things. And so that deals with a branch of theology such as the second coming, unfulfilled prophecy, final judgment, heaven, hell. And I've referred tonight to the midnight cry and uh, where I deal with eschatology. I'll tell you something, if you were to... Uh, Look at the subjects I've preached on at Westminster Chapel. I think, I ha I'm not sure I've got it exactly right, but I think I spoke there 4,000 times in 25 years, roughly four times a week. Uh, and uh, if you would look at all the subjects, to find a teaching of mine on eschatology, uh, you'd be looking for a needle in a haystack. I just didn't deal with eschatology unless the text called for it. If we're going through a verse uh, and it called for the second coming, I'd preach on it. In 1 Corinthians 15, you know, resurrection of the dead, I'd deal with it. But it wasn't anything I dealt with much. And part of the reason for that is uh, when I first started preaching, uh, I was pastor of a church in Palmer, Tennessee. And my dad came to hear me preach. And I don't think he'd ever heard me before. And I was wanting to impress my dad. And in those days, I perfectly understood the book of Revelation. <laughs> 19 years old, I knew it all. I got my best sermon on the rapture, seven-year tribulation, the second coming, the millennium. Oh, it was brilliant. It was wonderful. Except that after the sermon, my dad said nothing. He was quiet. Two hours later, he said, son, let me give you some advice. The man I named you after, R.T. Williams, if you didn't know, the reason I go by R.T., my dad named me after his favorite preacher, Dr. R.T. Williams. My name is Robert Tillman, but call me R.T., don't call me Robert. <laughs> Don't call me Bob. <laughs> R.T. He said, the man I named you after gave this advice to young ministers. Young men, he said, stay away from the subject of prophecy. Let the old men do that. <laughs> that way they won't be around to see their mistakes. So I'm old. I'm, I'm slipping in my book, The Midnight Cry. And as I go to heaven, I'll say, goodbye, enjoy it. <laughs> Another branch is theology and ethics. We'll just run through this quickly because I promised to quit on time. Closely parallel with the study of theology is the study of ethics. Ethics means moral principles or values. Ethics deals partly with the relevance, the relevance of theology. Why study it? What's the point? Well, uh, people tend to be more interested in ethics than they do pure theology, and I can understand that. But theological ethics covers such subjects as marriage, family issues, economics, politics, environment, sociology, medicine, and psychology. Another branch, theology and spirituality. Whereas the subject of spirituality overlaps with many of the things I've mentioned, uh, like sanctification or the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, there's a need for a particular emphasis on the place of prayer in the life of the church. The place of prayer 
in the life of the believer. Uh, how much do you pray? How much do you pray? Do you have a Bible reading plan? You just go to the Bible and say, Lord, what shall I read today? Okay, one king, Adonijah, sets himself up as king. You read about half of it and say, thank you, Lord. It's enough for today. <laughs> and this is just about how deep some people are. The place of prayer, witnessing, soul winning. <laughs> this is not going to endear me to you. I'm going to ask you a question. Have you personally ever led a soul to Jesus? Have you ever led a soul to Christ? Soul winning, witnessing, how to read the Bible, the place of preaching, worship. This is part of theology and spirituality. Revival. And so, this is why I say learning theology on your knees is an aspect of our burden that will hopefully preserve us from arid, sterile, irrelevant kind of emphasis that hasn't been very helpful. So, I think we've got a long way to go. All right. Why else should we pursue this course of theology? We have access to teaching that would normally require going to college or seminary. And none of you presumably have been. If you have, you here, that's great. But what I want to do is, is give you a little bit uh, those of you that haven't been to seminary, Bible school, college, university, just give you a little bit. But I can tell you now what I'm going to give you will cover things that they won't give you there. We're not going to be, hopefully, sterile. So our private devotional times should be more productive. You understand the scripture more than ever. I want to end with John 14, 26. The Holy Spirit promises to remind you of everything Jesus taught. That's what he said. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will be your reminder. He'll bring to remembrance what you learned. There are those who say, I just want to be full of the Holy Ghost. Good. But what if you're empty-headed and you're full of the Holy Ghost? You say, well, what I need is somebody to pray for me, and I fall to the floor. Look, if you're empty-headed when you fall, you'll be empty-headed when you get up. <laughs> I believe revival is coming, and those who've taken the time to want to learn things like this, I believe will be earmarked as sovereign vessels in the next great move of God. There will be no superstars in the coming revival. You will be the stars. Uh, my question is, you spoke about you believing that there's a coming awakening before the second coming. Why is that? Good question. Uh, I've written a, a big book called Midnight Cry. I hope you'll read it. <laughs> I'll try to be succinct. Parable of the twelve of ten virgins uh, in Matthew 25, the first 13 verses. And verse 6 says, at midnight a cry was made. Many have thought that the cry and the second coming of Jesus were simultaneous. Look more carefully. The cry came and the coming later. The whole church was awakened. The ten virgins are a symbol of the church. They all were awakened. And some realized that they did not have oil in their vessels. But there are other verses in the Bible. It's just that my book is on that one. Uh, but verses like, The glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. I think the next great revival, I've called it Isaac. Uh, I don't want to open that. Maybe shouldn't have said that word because you're going to now want to know what that is. But the great revival coming will see millions of Muslims converted, the blindness of, on Israel lifted, and all this after the cry, but I can't say more because it's, you know, it would take two hours. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, next. Someone fill this mic, let's be ready. 
my question is... 30, we're quitting. My question is this. When Christ was teaching, he said that on earth he had power to forgive sins. But on the cross, he had to call his father to forgive them because they didn't know what they're doing. So my question is, does it have to do with being son of God and being son of man? Do they have any relationship? The relationship between son of God and son of man? Well, that's a heavy question, but that didn't come out of tonight's Bible study, did it? I, oh, okay. <laughs> but, but wait a minute. I, I, but it's not your fault. I should have said, all questions should come from tonight's study. Okay. But since you ask, because I don't want anybody to think I'm avoiding them, the word son of man that Jesus chose for himself was not what most people think. It's not a reference to his humanity. It's not a, the son of man was a reference to the book of Daniel, who was a godlike figure. And for him to claim to be son of man was the boldest thing ever. It was equivalent to being son of God. But we'll have to leave it at that. I just want to answer your question. Leave it for that, because we didn't do that tonight. Okay, dear, your turn. Yeah. Uh, you sp you sp uh, Pastor R.T., you spoke about the, based upon the husband, the father, it's not about your, what you did or what your position is or your status that you are being rewarded, but you said the law the, based upon your, to be a, a, a father, a husband or whatever it is. You're talking about what gets a reward. Yeah, the reward. Yeah. And if it's based upon those low position or just the natural position that we have, and how about those people who strive to really, you know, like all of us here right now, we're, we're trying to study the word, we're trying to preach, preach the word and um, Saving the lost. I'm not sure on your question. And let me answer the question as I think I hear it. Mm -hmm. And if I haven't answered you, you come back and yeah. say, no, you didn't answer my question. Reward is not based upon how much you know, mm -hmm. how well known you are. Uh, Colin Dye will not get a reward for being pastor of Kensington Temple. I've written a lot of books. Mm -hmm. My reward is here below. I won't get it there. My reward will be on whether I resisted temptation, whether I had a love for the glory of God, subject next week, by the way, a love for the glory of God more than the praise of men. That's yeah. it. You will not get a reward because you understand my teaching. You'll get a reward because you came to try to understand it. And God sees your heart that you wanted it. Does that help? Yeah. Um, is it the reward here or reward after? You mean, I mean where is the reward? Is it then or now? Is that it? Yeah. Good question. That's a good question. <laughs> Enough that the other wasn't, but that one's very good. <laughs> Both. Oh. Both. That's great. <laughs> Both. <laughs> good. Good. Good evening. Uh, you mentioned about the word being the infallible word of God. I wonder if you could maybe uh, talk about your opinion about inerrancy. And also, I think this is related. You talked about um, throughout church history there being uh, different understandings of theology. And uh, do you believe in a progressive revelation? Uh, and if that is tied to inerrancy or not, if that makes sense. Well, you just asked a question that would take a whole evening to answer. <laughs> Uh, I just, I wasn't trying to prove my statement, and maybe I would have been wise not to have said it, because I should have known somebody like you. <laughs> we, we, it's fair game. I don't blame you. You had a right to ask that. It would come up. I do not believe in the dictation theory of inspiration. I don't think that John was governed by a hand on his hand, writing every word. I think John, Matthew, Paul had freedom to write what they said is true because what they believed is true. And it's infallible because what they believed is the truth, doctrine of revelation. Uh, at the same time, uh, some of the accounts of Jesus were based upon word of mouth. So you can find some discrepancies between 
on, on, the, story, on the resurrection accounts. Was it three women or one woman? Uh, and if you go by Matthew, uh, he got his information from this or that. So, Tom, there will be little minor ind- uh, discrepancies. Uh, but that said, they are so minor that if a person wants to deny infallibility of Scripture because they're, if you look at the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, see a little change here and there. Like in Matthew, two people were demon, demon-possessed, Luke 1. Uh, Matthew says the sermon was on the mount. Luke, it was on the plain. Uh, people say, see there, it's not the same. Uh, I don't even worry about things like that. What matters is what the writer stated was true. And uh, I'll leave it at that. I call it infallible. It's not going to fail you. You can rely on this because it's infallible. If we did, and we might, I don't know, have a whole evening on inspiration, we get into that more detail. But thank you. Thank you. Okay? Who's next? Come ahead. Um, you mentioned, or you asked us, uh, have you won souls for the kingdom? Uh, is that, do you think, is that a, a major requirement for every Christian? And if so, what else would you uh, say is a major requirement for a Christian? What, what was the first part of your question? Uh, you mentioned, um, have, you asked us, have you won any souls for the kingdom? If they... Have you... Have you won a soul? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I did ask that. Yeah. What, okay. if, if, um, is that a major requirement for every Christian? If so, what, what else would you say is a major requirement? Fair question. No. No, it's not what gets you to heaven. Uh, but it would show your gratitude to God for what he's done for you that you'd want to see them saved. So not a major requirement, but I would push it pretty hard. You ought to make every effort to be a soul winner. But that's a good question. Thank so it doesn't take. So it doesn't. So you don't have to be. So it doesn't have to be your calling just to 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 to, to win souls. Oh, I think all of us are called to be yeah. witnesses, yeah. but some uh, get paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> but we at Westminster Chapel, we had our pilot light ministry. And I led the way. For the last 20 years I was there, I was on the streets of Victoria uh, and on the steps of my chapel every Saturday for 20 years. And I led a few to the Lord, but our people did most of it. One of our deacons, I I will, you're standing to wait. We'll take your question next, and and I I just want to say this. Oh, boy, we got... I won't finish that sentence. I'm just going to tell a story. I'll tell it next week. Okay, who's next? <laughs> I want to quit on time. We've got to hurry. Uh, good evening. Uh, you just said uh, a while ago that there are two kinds of church. Uh, I just want to ask, which church will be good to be at? A church which is word or spirit? <laughs> good. That's a good question. That's a good question. As Paul would say in Philippians 2, 13, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Your question. You, you quoted the verse that the time will come when, when men will not put up with sound doctrine. And Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? You, you said that you believe there's going to be a great revival prior to that. Do, do you think that's actually the case? Or is Jesus suggesting the opposite? That question about will the Son of Man find faith on the earth it's a fair question because the virgins were asleep. But thankfully, the midnight cry is going to wake them up. Uh, another thing to be said about that, that that verse came at the end of the parable of the importunate widow. You know, it says, keep on praying. And then at the end, it says, will the Son of Man, when he comes, will he find faith? Will you still be believing? Because I've got a big sermon on that. In my book, it ain't over till it's over. Uh, the first sermon, uh, the first chapter in there is about not giving up and praying because it ain't over till it's over. But will the Son of Man find you believing when he intervenes is another way to look at that. Uh, heavy question. I won't try to solve it all now. <laughs>